As I said, tonight's guest is Brian Forrester, and uh, Brian has been getting a lot of heat lately. And I had an interesting encounter last night because of this. Now, uh, Brian's been in the news because he has claimed that the DNA he set out, sent out from the elongated skulls has come back as not entirely human. Now, Brian has been very careful about what he has released on this, and you're going to hear what Brian actually has to say about this in a few minutes. But there have been a number of uh, articles written that were full of misinformation and full of personal attacks against Brian. And uh, someone had posted one of these in one of the groups I was in, a group I had never actually looked at before, and I, I made the mistake of commenting that this was more of a personal attack and had nothing to do with Brian's research. Clearly, it was just that an agenda to attack Brian. This resulted in me getting attacked, even though I never uh, did or uh, said anything hostile to anyone in the group or about the group. I just made the point that the, the article was inaccurate. Now, uh, this resulted in me getting kicked out of the group, and uh, that was kind of a weird experience for me because I usually expect people, I guess, to be a little more open-minded. Uh, there is a good article on bad archaeology about Brian Forrester and the elongated skulls that does not attack Brian, but attacks the research. And uh, if you're going to attack somebody, I mean, at least make it obvious you're attacking them. The, the article in question originated with Doubtful News. Um, Brian did contact Doubtful News and corrected many of the mis, uh, much of the misinformation in the article. Beyond that, uh, someone else wrote an article based on the Doubtful News article, and really it was a hit piece on Brian. And the way it's written, it makes it sound like Brian's accused, or, or saying that these skulls are extraterrestrial, and Brian never says that. At the very end of the article, they do kind of quickly mention, oh, Brian never actually said they're extraterrestrial. But the whole article is about how the, the, uh, there's a claim that these are extraterrestrial, and it's about Brian and questioning who he is as a person, rather than critiquing maybe how he got the research done, or the fact that he released preliminary research without any evidence. So... Um, we're going to let Brian, you know, talk about that in his own words. But uh, as far as I'm concerned, you can like or dislike someone. It really doesn't matter. But if you're going to attack the work, attack the work, not the person. If you're going to attack the person, don't hide it behind the mask of attacking the work. <sighs> All right. So with that said, we are going to uh, hear this interview with Brian Forrester. We do talk about the elongated skulls a bit. Then we talk about, um, we talk about Peru and we talk about Egypt. And we talk about the comparisons between the two. And we also talk about a project he has going at Puma Punku, which I think is very interesting. And I'd never really heard too much about it. And uh, if it turns out to be uh, legit, that's really, really interesting. It's a way of dating stone. So, uh, all right. Next week, uh, next week we have Alex Sakiris from Skeptigo on. We're going to be dealing with uh, different aspects of consciousness, near-death experiences, stuff like that. But for tonight... Ancient Mysteries and Such with Brian Forrester, and here we go. So, I'd like to welcome back to the show, Mr. Brian Forrester. How are you doing, Brian? Good. How about you, Sir Ryan? I'm doing fantastic, and I uh, thank you for spending some time with us to talk about some of the stuff you've been doing. You've got, you're doing a lot of different stuff right now, aren't you? Uh, yeah, I would say I definitely am doing that. <laughs> Well, let's. Uh, the thing that's been been uh, talked about the most lately. Let's start with that, which is the uh, DNA of the elongated skulls. And uh, I think we talked. I think literally exactly a year ago, and you had no information yet on the DNA. Now, has all the DNA come back on that? No, just the initial. There's been some initial testing and uh, some initial results coming out from that. Okay. Now, who did the DNA testing? Uh, it's a well-established geneticist in, in the United States. He prefers to be anonymous at this point because he actually wants to write his own peer-reviewable paper. So he wants to make sure that he has substantial um, you know, data and inf he makes himself and the work itself public. Okay. All right. Well, that's fair. So he is peer-reviewing it and putting it out there for everyone. Yeah, that's what he's definitely planning on. And uh, the thing is that he's shown, you know, it's been more than two years that I and a lot of people have been waiting for basically any kind of result. And he seemed quite shocked with what he, he found initially. And so that's why he wants to continue on, you know, in, in, in 
private for a while until he has something really substantial to be able to, uh, you know, tell the world and the scientific community. Okay. And uh, it's been reported in various places that Melba Ketchum was doing this, and she's not involved, did she? No, she's not involved in this testing whatsoever. She's, uh, <clears throat> I've, I've been in contact with her about, about doing other testing, but um, so far have had nothing back from Melba um, as regards to what she's been working on. Okay. All right. And what, what were the DNA, the preliminary re DNA results? Uh, well, what I can say is that... Um, he, you know, the, the thing is, there, there's a thing called GenBank, which is the global database of DNA, uh, decoded DNA information located in the United States. And so what a geneticist does is when they have a sample, they send, I, I think through email, basically, or th by electronic means, they send uh, their decoded information to GenBank and their mega computer, I guess, compares it with what, uh, you know, w what is present in the database. And so from that, you know, that's how people have been able to find out, you know, I'm 25% Native American or I have a bit of, of Japanese or something, um, you know, in, in my background. And uh, what he got back was quite startling because it said that there were certain segments of, of the DNA uh, that he sent in which doesn't match anything um, in the Homo sapiens database, also nothing in the Neanderthal database, and nothing in the uh, Denisovan database. So that kind of shocked him, and that's when he contacted me, and that's when uh, I released it to the world. Uh, some might say prematurely, but again, it's it's an initial result, and I thought it was important after two years that people, you know, get some kind of information about it. And the implications of that is it could be another line of human. Well, it could be that. I mean, the ramifications are incredible, and that's why we want to make sure that there's a lot of replication of the tests done and, uh, you know, to make sure that it's not some kind of anomaly. Right, right. And uh, you have not in any way put any kind of religious significance or anything like that. That was all coming from L.A. Marzulli, who you've worked with, correct? Well, yeah, I have no, um, you know, no real comments about um, any kind of religious anything about it. I just find it intriguing. The ramifications could be uh, that it represents uh, a branch of, of Homo sapiens. Um, and, you know, you from there, you know, that's the most logical answer. But from there, you could go a lot farther. Right. And a lot farther afield, you know, hint, hint. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, but you're, you're, uh, what you're stating so far is just that you have preliminary results that are interesting, but don't say anything exactly yet. Well, they say something really interesting, but until there's been more replications, until the first results have been substantiated, then there honestly is not much more to say. But uh, the Paracas culture. Uh, which the you know which the the DNA is from are one of the strangest cultures in Peru, and we were actually um, at the uh, the the main archaeology museum in Lima today, and um, there you know we talked to one or two of their experts, and they said that the the Paracas are the least understood of the major cultures of Peru. They, they know a lot more about the Inca and other cultures, but the Paracas um, are still relatively obscure. And that's, you know, I lived in Paracas for two years studying this, and I, I have been astonished that there hasn't been more, you know, more international or even local work done on the culture because, they're, you know, they had elongated heads and, um, and a, a lot of other things um, happening with them 2,000 plus years ago. So... Uh, it's something I'm definitely going to, you know, continue on with for probably decades to come. Great. Um, and, and let's explain to people too the elongated skulls. These are not just deformities. There, there are some that are, were that were boarded to to grow that way. But the ones you're doing the DNA research on are different. They're not like just uh, a medical condition causing them. Yeah, like the the vast majority of elongated skulls, whether you find them in Paracas or um, other parts of Peru or Bolivia or 
Melanesia or Iraq. I mean, it was a global phenomenon, especially about 2,000 years ago. And of course, you know, um, in the vast majority of cases, it was the res result of cranial deformation or head binding that was done to babies. Uh, but there are some examples of the Paracas in, in different museums, too, which are so complicated in their structure and shape that it's very unlikely that they were examples of, um, of uh, headboarding or something. Because as you, I believe, indicated, a lot of them you can see a flattened area in the back of the skull. So that's where you know some kind of stiff material would have been placed and then wrapped with some kind of uh, string or textile in order to alter the shape of the head. But some of the Paracas ones literally do look like they were born that way. And they, they only have two plates on the head as opposed to the normal three, right? Yeah, some of them, um, about I would guess about 5% of them, or maybe even 10% of them, have only one parietal plate. And you and I both have two of them. Okay. Um, and um, there are other characteristics which are kind of odd, too. They're... Their eye sockets are quite large. They have two holes in the back of their heads where supposedly uh, nerve and blood flow came out, which may be a evolutionary thing to uh, accommodate the, uh, you know, the different shape of the head if it's genetic. Um, possible dental, genetic dental problems, uh, massive jaws, and many other characteristics, which I'm still, you know, in the process of studying. And it really makes you wonder when, when you say these are only like 2,000 years old, how little we know, just even about our recent history. I mean, you have all the bones of giants that have been dug up around the world, and then you have these elongated skulls, and science doesn't want to be bothered with any of it. Yeah, that's very true. I mean, the you know, there are, as you know, hundreds if not thousands of cases in the United States, especially between the late 18th and early 19th century that showed up in... Yeah, newspapers all, from all over the place that showed really tall people, uh, their skeletons having been dug up. You know, the term giant's kind of difficult to use, but we are talking, you know, seven foot, eight foot, and maybe taller people. And um, yeah, conventional science basically just uh, shoves that, that whole topic under the rug. Uh, supposedly, none of the skeletons which have been found are on public display for people to look at. Uh, they may have been closeted away in places like the Smithsonian. And so, um, it, you know, it's thankful now that we have, uh, you know, everyone has digital photography and video even on their phones. And um, because we have the Internet, information, new information that comes up can be spread a lot faster to a lot more people before any attempt at cover-ups uh, can happen, I hope. Yeah, yeah, true. The uh, but But like I said, it's like, being only 2,000 years ago, it's like what happened in just the last 2,000 years that, that these things have stopped existing? Yeah, well, actually, I'm developing more and more evidence of the fact that the, uh, the Paracas as a culture may have been annihilated by the, the famous Nazca culture, the supposed maker of the Nazca lines, because hmm. it is known that they moved into the Paracas territory about 2,000 years ago, and then all of a sudden with the demise of the Paracas culture and then the rise of the Nazca culture, cranial deformation and elongated skulls basically disappear. So, you know, that's quite an intriguing thing. And also, we do know that it was only the royal family of the Paracas that had these elongated heads. So, uh, it is possible that they were exterminated by the Nazca. That's, a, that's something I'm working on uh, a lot right now. Hmm. But if it was another race of beings, wouldn't there have been more than just a few of them at some point? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, there are more than 300 elongated skull mummies in the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology in Lima mm. that were excavated in the 1920s and 30s. Um, and, you know, muse other museums in Peru, like at Ica, Paracas, and other places um, have displays of these skulls. So, uh, they're probably, and internationally too, like I think the different museums in the U.S. and Europe have them from Paracas specifically. So uh, there were probably, you know, at least a thousand if more than, you know, possibly several thousand of these elongated uh, headed people at, at uh, one time over the course of at least a thousand years. Wow. And that's just the ones we found. Yeah, well, exactly. There are... 
innumerable that are still buried in the ground at, at the royal, you know, the different royal graveyards. And thankfully, um, tomb robbing, which has been, uh, you know, a terrible phenomenon going on in Peru, especially in the early 20th century, has to some degree come to an end because of, you know, there being guards and other officials protecting these very sensitive archaeological sites. Hmm. The uh, cranial deformation is also strange because it is practiced all over the world. And wasn't it supposedly a, a way of, of uh, trying to be more like their, their gods or something to that effect? Well, if you look at the global phenomenon and what uh, we've been able to glean from the different cultures practicing this as written in uh, the book that David Hatcher Childress and I wrote called The Enigma of Cranial Deformation, there are three basic characteristics that are, are common to most of those cultures, or at least many of them. One of them, it's believed that it made the children more intelligent. Number two, it was something aesthetic. They, they thought that people with elongated heads were more attractive than commoners. And number three, which is the intriguing part, is uh, that supposedly is what the ancestors originally looked like. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, hopefully, do you have any idea how long it's going to take before his peer-reviewed work comes out? No, not really. Um, you know, it's been two years to get uh, initial results so far, but because he's very keen with it, and we may expand into working with other probably American-based geneticists, uh, then uh, the process might, you know, accelerate at this point because there is, you know, there is global interest now that initial results have been released, you know, for a long time. People kept saying, well, you know, what are the results? What are the results? And the longer you can tell them nothing, the less interested they're going to be. <laughs> so we, we are planning on, a, on a, a, you know, an international fundraiser, uh, hopefully within three or four months. And uh, we're hoping that will generate some money so that the geneticists can at least cover their costs. They're not looking for money, you know, for themselves or to pay for their, um, you know, their their time as much as running this incredibly expensive and complicated equipment. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, so I also heard you're, you're working on with someone who has a new way of dating stone and that you're, you're looking at Puma Punku as one of the first places to try this. Yeah, there's a new uh, technique, uh, I believe an American um, invention, which is called cosmogenic testing. And, you know, for the longest period, People have been saying, well, why don't you carbon-14, uh, you know, test stone, and then everyone comes back and says, you can't, you know, you can't uh, test stone for its age unless it's like 100,000 years old. Then there are other uh, te techniques that can do that. But what cosmogenic testing is, is it measures the amount of time that the surface of stone has been in contact with the environment, more specifically with cosmic rays. And so it's almost the opposite of carbon-14 because carbon-14 is the break, you know, the breakdown of, of carbon-14. And so right. uh, with a half-life, you can measure back, you know, back in time as to when it would have been uh, complete. And so cosmogenic testing is the opposite. It's actually the buildup of a special form of beryllium that happens. And so uh, there are three samples being worked on very diligently right now by an international group of scientists doing multiple testing and um, it's proceeding quite well next month we're, we're hoping to get the, the, the main results out uh, and so uh, that's quite fascinating and if it works uh, then we're going to try to use it the same technique uh, with stone from other ancient megalithic sites around the world and why did you pick Puma Punku to start? well just because Puma Punku is such an enigma uh, you know, most people don't even know what Puma Punku is, but it's a very strange site in the highlands of Bolivia, just south of uh, the shore of Lake Titicaca. It's a quaint. It's associated with another site called Tiwanaku. Uh, you know, we we did a whole episode of Ancient Aliens on it because the surfaces of the stone there are so incredibly precise that there's no way that um, you know a primitive people could have shaped these stones. It's uh, you know, it, the stuff is as flat as tabletops. And so uh, Puma Punku was chosen as the, as the first candidate just because it's such an enigma. Most academics have kind of ignored the place or like labeled it as being maximum 2,000 years old. 
but through cosmogenic testing, if we get a different result, um, you know, older than that, then that will bring more interest um, towards the Pumapunku site for further exploration. And if you had a guess, how old do you think it might be? Well, I hate to I hate to guess, but I I would be really happy if the result is like four thousand, six thousand. My goal would be twelve thousand, just because it's an intriguing date. Because that right. was that was when the uh, supposedly when the end of the ice age happened, and uh, you know there's a ma major cataclysmic events happened all over the planet. So if if it did turn out to be twelve thousand years or older, I would be incredibly pleased. But we won't know until we get the actual results back. Okay. And uh, now Puma Punko has these big sort of H-like structures there. Yeah, the the famous H blocks of which there are. At last count, when I was there about a month ago, I think there are only nine of them left. There could have been hundreds of them because only five or ten percent. Uh, Puma Punku was left. Um, it was used as a quarry site uh, from starting about a thousand years ago all the way through the colonial Spanish times. They they built some parts of buildings in the capital of Bolivia, La Paz, out of Puma Punku. And then the worst thing happened when they were building a railroad going close by. They used dynamite and blew some of the of the stones oh. up in order to build the railway bed so of course uh, yeah but like you know even if there were only a handful of stones left uh it would still be an incredibly intriguing site and you know luckily there are you know at a guess at least a hundred stones of of uh, really major obscure and, and, and enigmatic interest and you have any idea what these stones were used for these giant h's no, different people have different theories. I'm completely perplexed because each one is actually slightly different. Some people have had theories that they were made in molds in an assembly line, but they're all different um, in terms of their proportions. The The backsides of them are all different. And I, I honestly don't know what they are, but um, they, they also there are almost no... 90 degree angles they're all more complex angles than that and they actually form uh, dovetail joints they're not uh, again they're not right angles and so whoever was doing this work had to have an incredibly specific reason for putting all of that time and effort into into shaping them that way huh. well by, by default if we don't know what it is doesn't it become a temple uh, yeah, it does, unfortunately. <laughs> Either a moon temple or a sun temple. Right. That's, a, that's the label in Peru and Bolivia. If you can't figure out what it is, it's either a sun temple or a moon temple. <laughs> um, I was just watching this video you have up of, uh, I, I can't pronounce it, S-A-I-H-U-I-T-E. That's Saiwite. Okay. And now this, the, you found some stones there that predate the Incas. Yeah, there's actually there's a very famous stone at Saiwite, which only a handful, if that, uh, tourists visit per per day because it's about three hours drive from Cusco, uh, so it's not that accessible. But it, there is this boulder about the size of a Volkswagen Beetle, and it the whole surface has been carved with animal shapes. Um, it's really astonishing to uh, to visit. But uh, the first trip I, I went there, I just went and and observed this stone and that was it and it wasn't until the second time I went that I noticed that down the hill from where this stone is there were all these other weird looking stones so I hiked down to look at them and what I found were these astonishing uh, cut surfaces some with stairways in them one of them you know again the size of an automobile split right down the middle um, and then beyond there were even more of these weird stones. So it's, uh, I'm, I'm glad I put that video up today because it's a site that 99.9% uh, .9 of tourists who visit Peru never see because they don't even know it exists. And you said there's, this doesn't show any sign of being an Incan construction. No, the thing is the stone uh, that, that uh, is there is called andesite. It's, it's at least as hard as granite. And so you would need at least steel... Uh, or diamond or carborundum or something to be able to shape it. The Inca were a Bronze Age culture, so there's no way they could have shaped uh, the really precise surfaces 
uh, there or at other sites like Puma Punku. Um, and I've taken a lot of engineers to to Cusco and and uh, you know that area looking at megaliths, and they they all have agreed that some of the sites attributed to the Inca, uh, which you know where you can't fit a human hair in between the stones, could not have been made by the Inca. They have to be older, because uh, the Inca were you know reasonably good stonemasons. The Spanish who came after them were actually not as good as the Inca were. So you have to look backwards in time to find out who it was that was doing this work. Huh. And uh, how will, and you say these could go back 12,000 years? Well, we're develop I and others are developing a theory again that uh, before the end of the last ice age, there may have been high civilizations existing in strategic parts of the world, one of them being uh, the Cusco Sacred Valley area, and that uh, this um, global catastrophe was so devastating that it probably wiped out a high percentage of the human population and uh, the only thing left behind after all that time would be something made of stone so you know these stones of which there are you know I would conservatively say thousands of uh, that dot the landscape conventional archaeology can't honestly explain you know who made them but when you take um, stonemasons and geologists and uh, uh, engineers and have them look at them, then they, you know, they uh, almost universally say, "Well, this, you know, this can't be the work of a Bronze Age culture." Um, we don't know who, you know, who who did the work, but it had to have been done by a, a society that had sophisticated technology on some level. And and a decade or two ago, the idea of a civilization that could do this existing, what it was laughed at. But now we have sites like uh, Gobekli Tepe. Which has been dated to that old and shows, you know, high technology workmanship on it. Well, exactly. Gobekli Tepe is the latest, um, you know, favorite uh, site for megalithic people because it's known to be at least ten, if not twelve thousand years old. It seemed to have been buried on purpose in a very controlled and delicate manner. And you know, of course, the problem is that um, you've had this big divide between. Uh, conventional science and uh, you know people who are students of oral traditions or even clairvoyants or psychics or whoever so you know a anything mentioning terminology like Atlantis is automatically laughed at by conventional scientists but now we're looking at at uh, you know structures that would have theoretically existed according to Plato around the time of Atlantis around 12,000 years ago so this stuff can't be laugh you know laughed at anymore well let's uh, we gotta take a quick break we'll be back in about a minute with more from Brian Forster The opinions expressed by the host and guests on Where Did the Road Go are their own and do not represent those of WVBR or its management. Join us on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com where you can send us questions for our live guests via email or the live chat room. You can also check out our upcoming schedule, blog, link section, book reviews, videos, and links to our Twitter, Facebook, iTunes, and much more. That's wheredidtheroadgo.com. All right, and uh, we're talking tonight with Brian Forrester, and uh, you want to give everyone your website? Sure. Uh, my main website is hiddenincatours.com. Okay, and you have upcoming at the end of March, a. Uh, is this the second time you're going to Egypt now? Yeah, it is. The last, uh, the last trip was in April, and so we're basically making this a yearly adventure, you know, in the March to April time frame, so... Uh, the new tour starts on March 30th. Okay, and uh, people can find that at your website. Yeah, and it, uh, yeah, on. right, right on the on the homepage. And uh, wh where did you go last time you went to Egypt? Oh, it was incredible. We we went all over the place. Uh, we went all the way from Aswan in the south, where the the great rose granite quarry is, and where there's still a 1,200 ton obelisk that's you know left was left unfinished all the way north to Alexandria which is on the Mediterranean but we mainly uh, focus to some degree on the Giza Plateau area which is much bigger than most people realize because um, 
you know, archaeologists or, or whoever have a tendency to label certain sites. And so when most people think of, of Giza, they think of the three pyramids and the Sphinx. But it's actually much more extensive um, and, you know, goes on for miles in uh, north to south, I believe. Um, we found evidence of tunnels underneath the Giza Plateau, of which I got to walk through down to the second level. Um, and so there, there are super obvious signs and examples of lost ancient high technology in Egypt, which clearly predate the, the dynastic Egyptians and pharaohs. Now, are these the tunnels that supposedly have the bull coffins in them? Well, that's actually, that's kind of part of it. That's called the Serapium. And it's a, it's a quite a, at this point, a short tunnel system. But there is a door, like you, you go down into the Serapium. I would guess it's a walk down of between 50 and 100 feet uh, underground. And there is a giant steel door at the end, which of course is tantalizing because there's probably more of the tunnel going through that way, but the actual tunnel system of Giza is several miles long going north, south, east, and west, and, uh, you know, they are, the tunnels are, are tall enough that you can walk right through them. And what do uh, archaeologists explain them as? Uh, normally the doors are locked, so you, nobody's allowed in. Oh. So, so that's the thing. All over the Giza Plateau, you'll see these locked doors all over the place. Those are a lot of those are accesses to the tunnel system, but uh, tour guides are not allowed to, um, you know, take people in. Uh, but recently, because of the, you know, the, I would say the changes in Egypt, and now that the ancient sites are not controlled by this one man called Zahi Hawass, uh, a number of these uh, of these gates have been opened. Uh, to the public, and so it's really exciting to be able to go into into these places that have been uh, inaccessible for at least fifty years. And and the these bull coffins were there's never been any bulls found in them or anything else, have there? No, that's the whole thing. The name the Serapium, I think, is based on the Greek, and it, you know it it means the place of the sacred bull, uh, the Apis bull, and it is a bunch of bull because no <laughs> no um, I mean there are twenty nine of them I think. Of these huge, like not just sarcot, like they're what they are are huge boxes. You know, they'll they're labeled as sarcophagi, but they're big enough to, you know, to fit quite a, you know, I would say quite a few bowls in each one. Oh. Uh, at a guess, they're like 15 feet long, or 12 to 15 feet long, um, eight feet high, and at least six feet wide. So that's a pretty big box. Uh, the each box is hollowed out uh, to a finish of close to perfect flatness of within, in some cases, two ten thousandths of an inch, which is not something you can do by hand. The boxes weigh on average 70 tons, and the lids weigh on average 15 tons. Uh, and a lot of that stone came from Aswan, which is 500 miles away. Now, what, what would be the purpose of a box like that? I mean... Discounting the idea of it being a bull coffin, I mean, what what else could it be used for? Well, the thing is, there are developing theories that the Giza Plateau was part of an ancient energy system, as wild as that sounds. And so the Great Pyramid, for example, is thought to have actually been an electrical generator based on um, the ability to break water into its component parts, generating hydrogen. And so what uh, some of the theories about the Serapium, where these giant boxes are, was that they were actual, uh, almost like condensers, or places where energy somehow was stored, whether it was stored in water or what, um, no one really knows. But what it's kind of looking like is that the ancient um, technology on the Giza Plateau may be exactly what 21st uh, century uh, scientists are looking for, and that's for clean, cheap, and almost free sources of energy. So it's possible that the 21st century work is a reflection of work that was done 12,000 or more years ago. And do you, do you think the pyramids date back to that time period? I do, yeah. I, I, I think definitely. The, I, the idea that they were made by arrogant pharaohs as, uh, as tombs, I think is really, <laughs> at this point, really silly because they are so, again, technically precise in construction. Um, just astonishing. Uh, there, you know, there are, again, places where you can't fit a human hair 
in between the blocks. Uh, the Great Pyramid is made up of at least 2.2 million multi-ton stones. Um, and the experience of actually being inside, which we had the chance of being inside the Great Pyramid for two hours, uh, just our tour group alone, is one of the most phenomenal experiences of my life because um, I honestly felt like I was inside the bowels of a giant ancient machine. Hmm. Hmm. And then Christopher Dunn is the one that originally came up with this theory, correct? Yeah, Christopher Dunn's um, incredible book called The Giza Power Plant um, is, uh, is, is a phenomenal read. It's the basis of a lot of other uh, theories. Um, and we were very fortunate in that Chris Dunn was with us last April to uh, tell us the story himself. Hmm. Okay, and uh, what about the, now, the evidence that they present saying that the uh, pyramids are not 12,000 years old are the, uh, the writings above the relief chambers. Yeah, that's right. There's a, there are some hieroglyphics or, or glyphs written in red ochre paint which supposedly talk about Khufu, and so automatically Egyptologists have said, well, if somebody did a painting in red ochre paint that has the name Khufu, obviously he's the guy who built it. But it's the, uh, you know, my analogy is the, it's the equivalent of somebody going up to a brand new Maserati with a key and carving their name into it, and then, you know, the car is found later, and, uh, you know, from then on, the, the Maserati was not only designed but it was built and probably driven by some guy called Bob. <laughs> nice. Well, were you able to check those out, those that red ochre? No. Actually, the relieving chambers were off limits. Uh, actually, not off limits, but we would have had to pay something like 2000 to $5,000 wow. to go up into it. And so, you know, we had two hours in the king's chamber, the Queen's Chamber, and I spent most of my time in the subterranean chamber, which is actually underground in the bedrock. And that was, you know, that was, you know, with only two hours, we had to maximize our time. But we are, we do have access once again to the Great Pyramid uh, in uh, at, at the end of March. And so uh, we'll see. It, it may be possible that the, the relieving chambers will be open or that we'll be able to access them without, you know, having to sell one of the members of the, of the tour team off. Because <laughs> um, from what I understood, the reason that they believed it to be there from the time it was built was because it seems to go under the blocks. Well, that's a good question. That I honestly don't know. But I, you know, what I do know is that there, ha there has been too much, um, you, know, spec you know, like major... Uh, speculation or or names of buildings being given based on what is really substan or not substantial but circum uh, circumstantial evidence like that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's a big difference between moving an 80 ton blant or granite block from Aswan and, and fitting it into the construction of the Great Pyramid, and somebody up there with uh, you know with a some kind of um, brush painting someone's you know cartouche on it. <laughs> what uh so what evidence do you think supports the 12,000 year old date? Well, again, it's uh it's it's possible that it's part of this global cataclysm that happened. Um some people speculate that uh and actually there is evidence of the of the idea that the Nile 12,000 years ago was not in the same place it is now. It was actually further to the west and uh there have been people who have done uh, satellite surveys and stuff and they have seen that there once was a great river to the west uh, and so if there was this catastrophic event that may have even altered the um, axis of the earth then some of the water systems of, of the planet may have had to not not necessarily change course but may have spilled over and had to create new you know a, a new riverbed and so it's uh, speculated that at that, of course, at that time, um, Egypt was not a desert. It was like a savanna, grassland area. There was abundant rainfall. Um, the Sphinx itself, uh, the weathering on the Sphinx, as shown by Dr. Robert Schock, is not the result of, of uh, windblown sand. It's the result of, of water weathering, like heavy-duty wa uh, water wa weathering, and it hasn't rained substantially uh, in... Egypt, uh, or that part of Egypt, for I think at least eight thousand years. So yeah, something like that. 
So it, it kind of does push the date back to somewhere around at least 10, maybe 12,000 years that the Sphinx was originally shaped. And I, I, just, I think the pyramids and the, uh, the tunnel system underneath that, uh, the pyramids are all part of this very ancient system. Now, is there evidence of flooding on the pyramids themselves? Yeah, from what I've heard, actually, uh, Stephen Mailer, who I believe you've interviewed, yes. and and who will be with us in Egypt and was with us in Egypt uh, last April, he said there is evidence of water weathering around the base parts of the pyramid, and so that's something we're definitely uh, definitely going to check out uh, this time. Uh, unfortunately, of course, most of the um, of the outer skin of the of the pyramids have been torn or were torn off over the course of uh, a long period of time, but some of the lower courses are still intact, uh, and so that's what I'm going to be kind of focusing some energy on is seeing if there's uh, evidence of erosion of the lower parts of uh, all three of the big pyramids. What would you say was the most astonishing thing you found in Egypt? Well, I would say that within the first half an hour of the first day of being on the Giza Plateau, walking around the Great Pyramid, I saw obvious examples of, um, of saw marks in basalt, which is a very hard stone. Again, it's about as hard as granite. Uh, and the you know by by measuring the the angle of the arc of what uh, that saw blade. Uh, or how that saw blade was moving through the stone, it had to have been somewhere in, in the uh, region of 15 to 20 feet in diameter. And also, uh, it was only the blade itself, I think, was between an eighth and maybe three sixteenths of an inch thick. And I don't know if we have saw blades like that presently because uh, I, I've been to, you know, I've been to where they cut marble, you know, with big saws. And those saws are have to be pretty thick. Uh, thick in order to be able to withstand, you know, cutting through uh, quite hard stone. So these uh, these are anomalous. And other sites we saw quite massive core drilling going on, like you know, larger than the size of my fist. Core drills going through. You can see the pattern of the drill as it was making its movement through the stone. Uh, every revolution seemed to be between two and three millimeters. So you're talking about something that had to be powered by some kind of mechanism. It wasn't some guy, you know, rotating it, you know, um, by hand. This had and very even marks too. So I think those are the telltale signs of lost ancient high technology. And what kind of metal do you think that would have been strong enough to go through this? Well, the uh, the actual cutting probably, you know, would have to be something like diamond. That's that's what we know can cut through almost any other material um, and so the actual blade itself um, you know I, I, I've been working with power tools all my life but I'm not an expert on you know the actual how you make a saw blade but I would guess it would have to be super hard tool steel of some kind uh, that wasn't brittle it had to be able to flex to some degree but not too much and again when you're talking about a blade that's maybe an eighth or three sixteenths of an inch thick 20 feet in diameter, if that blade was pushed beyond its tolerance, it would set up a vibration, and that would be an incredibly dangerous situation. So, um, you know, that's what, again why I'm really looking forward to going back to, uh, you know, videotape and photograph all of this stuff in much greater detail to show to you and the, uh, you know, the listening audience on my YouTube channel. Yes, and pe people should know you have a lot of videos up on your YouTube channel. Yeah, six, uh, I think 682 at the moment. 686. Oh, 686. Yes. <laughs> I forgot four. Okay. <laughs> um, and how long have you had the YouTube channel going? I think about uh, I think about four years, but uh, it start you know it's one of those things where of course you have to learn how to do it properly. Right. And uh, then I've been, you know, I've been teaching myself editing. I've been trying to make uh, the cuts really good, uh, and make, you know, make the each video flow so that people don't get bored. Um, they average now between five and ten minutes. Um, so yeah, it's a, you know, it's a work in progress. I, I really get a kick out of, out of making videos, um, and I love the fact that people enjoy watching and sharing them with other people. Yes, well, you have quite a lot of views on them, and I, I enjoy them every time you put them up. 
Um, where uh, is that linked on the Hidden Inca Tours site? Yeah, it is, and also I have another website, which is hiddenincavideos.com, and that's where I put uh, my I put my latest videos. I think there are about two hundred there, and they're all categorized too. So if you're interested in, in elongated skulls. That takes you to uh, videos just about that. Uh, Pyramids is, is another. Uh, Puma Punku has its own. Uh, and I think Inca Stonework has its own. Hmm. Okay. And if you had to compare Egypt and uh, Peru and such, would, do you see similarities? Is one more advanced than the other? Or do they have similar type of uh, constructions going on? Well, that's a really good question because I think Peru uh, and Egypt are two of the most intriguing, or if not the, the two most intriguing places to visit for those who are interested in megalithic or, you know, strange big stone structures. Uh, the type of technology seemingly used in Peru is quite different from that in Egypt. In Egypt, we see obvious uh, high-speed tool marks in Peru there are almost none. It almost seems like they were using technology that was able to mold and or shape the stone somehow. So it's a uh, Peru is a much more uh, enigmatic area to look at than uh, than Egypt. But the, the great thing about Egypt is that there are so many uh, huge constructions uh, just on the Giza Plateau itself. And just the sheer scale of these things you can't come to grips with until you are actually standing there. Uh, you know, videos don't do do them justice. When you're standing outside the Great Pyramid and you're looking up at uh, you know at its sheer scale, um, you know, I was completely dumbfounded. Um, and I'm used to looking at this kind of stuff. <laughs> um, so, do you think the cultures were in any way connected, or were they just did they spring up separately then? I'm not sure. You know, there are theories that there was a, a gl that there was global communication. Uh, that far back in time, uh, I think that um, that there was a lot more navigating um, on the, the the world's oceans in deep antiquity than most people, uh, academics included, give our ancestors um, due justice for. Um, and so, you know, I, I think it could have been a, a network of connected civilizations more than the possibility that it was one civilization. Uh, but also you have to take into account that uh, theoretically 12,000 years ago the world's oceans rose by 350 feet in as short as maybe three years and so a lot of the most intriguing ancient sites on the planet are presently underwater. Right, right, yes. Um, you, uh, you had a video on the uh, energy generating towers by Lake Titicaca. Yeah. What, what, you want to explain those a little bit? Yeah, they're they're at a, a place called Silustani, which is just northwest of uh, uh, of Lake Titicaca in Peru, and uh, they're these strange looking tower, like they are tower looking stone structures. Some of them are quite crude. Some of them are very very well made without mortar, uh, and they're very they're very odd looking, uh, especially the the biggest ones. Uh, the conventional academics say that they were funeral towers, which I believe because they have found um, skeletal parts in them, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they were initially built for that purpose. We had a number of, uh, of uh, energy dowsers with us in November with the group Megalithomania, and they were able to pick up very specific subtle energy patterns uh, as part of of the uh, the worldwide ancient grid uh, energy grid system uh, running right through that site and in fact right through some of these structures and um, you'd have to look up photos um, of Silustani but uh, the best looking towers or most interesting ones actually uh, are not straight up and down they taper from the bottom upwards which is not a very smart way to build a building normally a foundation will be big, you know, bigger at the at the base than it is higher up. But these were built uh, in the opposite way, and um, the stone is so tight fitting that uh, when you're inside of them and you resonate the tone uh, or letter A between A and A sharp, the whole building resonates. So uh, some engineers that we took there have speculated that these were some kind of energy resonating. 
uh, towers or part of an energy grid system in the deep distant past. And when when you compare that to the way the Great Pyramid is and the sonic qualities in there, do you do you see any similarities? I, the exact same thing. I mean, yeah. uh, I mean, the, again, the the Great Pyramid is so tight in terms of its construction that it seems to resonate as if it's one stone, and that's the key to why the ancient builders didn't use cement or mortar in between is because they wanted as close contact as possible between one stone and the other and when I was in the subterranean chamber I went through this narrow passage that had a dead end but when I was about halfway through there I just stopped and I could literally hear and feel this resonance that was that the energy or that the uh, pyramid was still generating about every two to two and a half seconds it was a almost like a woof kind of kind of sound very low but it went it was an energy that went right through my body it was quite an incredible experience uh, did you get to experience uh, any of the sonic qualities did anyone do any chanting or anything while you were there oh yeah actually that's the reason why I left the great the uh, the king's chamber <laughs> because of the noise <laughs> I mean we had we had probably 30 people in there who were all I think hitting the same tone again mm. it, again it was between when they were able to hit the right harmonic which was between A and A sharp the whole room I mean the sound was I wouldn't say deafening but it was so loud louder than the people's voices and so I left the you know I left the uh, the king's chamber went into the queen's chamber and I could still hear hear them toning when I was in the queen's chamber and even when I went down into the subterranean chamber the sound was make, <laughs> making its way down there and I don't think it was simply going through the passageways it felt like it was going through the building itself wow wow um you ever look at this stuff and think that we're we're kind of like monkeys playing around with some technology we just don't even have the slightest clue about well, honestly, I think that whoever these ancient people were, they had forms of technology that we can only theorize about, and that's counter to conventional history because you know we're we're taught to believe that we're the greatest things that ever existed because we have cell phones and nuclear power plants in J in Japan that are leaking radiation, you know, and all this <laughs> kind of stuff. And I, you know, it seems that whoever these ancient people were, they had the capability of. Uh, of building generating stations, um, transmitting sound, uh, great distances possibly, without all this mechanized um, oil consuming apparatus that we have. Uh, you know, I think the the Great Pyramid originally did have some kind of mechanical aspect to its interior, but not necessarily moving parts. It may have been uh, very sophisticated uh, condensers. Uh, transducers and things like that that um, over time were probably uh, you know uh, pulled out of, of the Great Pyramid a long long time ago before even its you know dis its so-called first uh, break-in was done I think during mm. uh, during the time of uh, one of the you know first group of, of Arabic people there so I just got that feeling I got this this feeling in the Great Pyramid of this hollow, you know, this hollowed out nature to it that originally it was a very vibrant thing that was um, something you did not want to be inside of when it was running but because mm. because it still seems to be generating some kind of residual energy at this point I, I think that's also why people love to meditate because I think some of the energy frequencies in there harmonize very well with the human body and mind and that's why people can go into the Great Pyramid and come out and will have had a, a real life-changing experience. You know, I, I always think about the way we got into it by blowing a hole in the side of it and just thinking, you know, we didn't even know what we were dealing with when we did that. We were just like, hey, let's get in there and see what we can find that's treasure. Ex well, exactly, and that's, you know, that's been... Uh, a sad fact in Peru as well, some beautiful structures that uh, have been dynamited even less than a hundred years ago because they thought since the Inca had so much gold they must have hid them inside some of these solid stone objects which they turned out to be, they weren't hollow, they were solid but the tops have been blown to pieces and uh, you know we as a human race in the last one or two thousand years have been such savages when it comes to earlier cultures um, 
you know, if you see photographs of Egypt taken or the Egyptian structures taken, say, a hundred or so years ago, these these areas were such a mess because they had been looted, pilfered, uh, hacked to pieces, blown up, etc. That it's amazing that the Egyptians have been able to put uh, much or you know as much back together that they have done. Uh, and my you know my hats off to all the all the diligence and hard work by Egyptologists and local workers and foreign governments and universities for financing and doing the hard work of, of reassembling some of these gorgeous uh, ancient temples. Huh. Um, one of the things that, that you had mentioned in the video of the, the large stone there uh, and that I've seen in other sites is this hitching post. And w uh, what do you think those are? I mean, they, they align with the sun, but for what reason? Well, th again, the problem is that, um, you know, almost almost too, well, too many sites in Peru and Bolivia have been called sun temples or moon temples. In this case, this strange looking object is called an Intihuatana, which is uh, Inca, which means the hitching post of the sun. The famous one is at Machu Picchu. It's this... Uh, right this outcrop that's multifaceted and you know quite weird looking uh, that uh, they attribute to the Inca as having been a solar calendar so whenever you know whenever it, something isn't called either a sun temple or a moon temple uh, quite often uh, if it if it's um, in any way uh, position north, south, east, and west it's automatically called a hitching post of the sun so I don't know if it was that um, it's it's just it's a very it's very un it's the only one of its kind I've ever seen, and I I look forward to going back again, uh, spending more more time than I did last time, and really get more of a sense of uh, possibly what it could have been uh, been made for. Do you think that some of these things were aligned to the sun and and, and different uh, stellar coordinates so that they could tell us like uh, Ren Ren Flamath's idea that there was a pole shift and they're trying to keep track of where these things should be in the sky to know if another one was coming. No, that's a great, that's a great point. Um, that's a point that most people wouldn't even think of because, uh, but yeah, that's a, that, that is a, a really, really brilliant point to make uh, because the idea that something like this would have been made for two or four days of the year is, is ridiculous. Anything like that, that uh, someone has spent so much time into the thought and the cutting and, uh, you know, shaping of, would probably use it on a continuous basis for some kind of very major function, not just some kind of celebration of the solstice and equinoxes, but something used to measure uh, you know, measure measure time, measure the seasons, measure the movements of constellations, or maybe even all of the above. Hmm. What um, I saw one video where you were in a pyramid that was either unfinished or had been uh, destroyed in some way. Uh, was that in Egypt? Yes. Um. Yeah, that's right. That's um, Abu. Gurab, I think. No, or is it Abu Gurab? I, I think that's the name of it. It's you know most most uh, people think that it was uh, simply a pyramid that was under construction and then abandoned. Uh, other people theorize that it was part of this power plant system, and that it became overloaded with energy and exploded. Oh. Um, but w the the most interesting thing about it no matter which theory is correct is is it's one of the few pyramids where you can actually go down into the into the bedrock of it because so much of it's missing right. and uh, you know you go down at least a hundred if not two hundred feet into the bedrock and it's a wonder how the bedrock itself was cut out uh, because the you know the Great Pyramid uh, and the other two major ones on Giza of course have passages going into the into the earth itself as well but this one gives us, you know, like a cutaway um, idea of how the other ones look. Yeah, yeah, and it was a really fascinating video to look at. I mean, the, the, the size of it was just incredible from the inside there. Yeah. But All right, well, we're almost out of time. Uh, you have this, this tour in Egypt, and this goes from when? Uh, it's uh, March 30th to April 12th. Okay, and, you, and do you have anything else beyond that coming up? Oh yeah, God, quite a few. Um, <laughs> they're all on on the homepage of my website. There's a, a chance we might go to Malta, 
in oh. April. Uh, May, we're doing a tour here of the elongated skulls of the coast of Peru. And then after that, we could be going to Turkey. Uh, and then after that, there are there's another two tours of Peru and Bolivia. And I'm probably missing another one or two. But those are the major ones uh, set up for this year. Wow. And uh, have you been to Malta before? No, I never have. And I've never been to Turkey. And Turkey... Uh, really fascinates me because there's a lot more there than you know go go Beckley Tepe's there but there are some incredible things like underground cities that yes. were you know carved out at Cappadocia and more and more if if you simply google ancient turkey you'll be a you know you'll be completely blown away by what is there in that country <laughs> Yeah, the underground cities have always fascinated me from the moment I found out about them, and it, it makes me draw comparisons to the, the Hopi tales of being taken into underground to survive the end of different worlds. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. So, all right, well, thank you for taking some time to talk to us, and uh, you said you'll have the results of some of the uh, testing in Puma Punku in a few months? Yeah, actually, the major testing is being done at Purdue University next month. But there are a number of other tests that are already being conducted. There are tests of, of, of the hardness of stone. Um, and then there's been microscopic analysis of the surface looking for tool marks. And actually, the, the two main researchers, uh, George and David, uh, one who is a, uh, a working professional and the, the other who is a, uh, a retired professor, uh, they're just going to town with this. They're doing a lot more than I... Than I imagine they would do, but they're they're both so intrigued with it. They're also bringing in other uh, major U.S. resources into this, so it's gone way beyond what we you know what we budgeted for. But thankfully, some of these institutions are offering their services for free because they find the subject quite fascinating. That is, that's really awesome. All right, and your two websites? Uh, again, my two main websites are hiddenincatours.com and hiddenincavideos.com. All right. Well, thank you so much.